Um, okay, our last speaker today in this session is Peter Bright, who is going to be talking about uh, his research, which takes a developmental approach to bilingual research. Um, so Peter, if you could share your screen and over to you, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right, can you see the screen okay? Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, today's um, subject um, is that um, we're hoping to really resolve the whole issue of whether bilingualism confers general cognitive benefits. Now there's a really vigorous debate in the literature and there's a considerable amount of uh, data, considerable amount of evidence suggesting that bilingualism does confer general cognitive advantages. Uh, and it's intuitively appealing if we consider that uh, in a bilingual mind, presumably the bilingual person when communicating has to inhibit one language while communicating in the other. And the theory is that this uh, process um, uh, kind of improves, it exercises our inhibitory control such that um, we can basically see real benefits which spill over from the linguistic domain into uh, issues of you know, executive function and so on. Um, but more recently, despite this large body of evidence, uh, there's been quite a lot of research and often research with larger sample sizes and meta-analyses as well, which indicate that um, the bilingual advantage may not be as real as some researchers may have thought to begin with. And they point to issues, methodological limitations, publication bias, um, issues with the tools that are used and so on. And so if we're to uh, resolve these issues, we really need to try to perhaps take a different approach. And our approach is to take a, a kind of a whole life trajectory approach to try to understand whether there's a bilingual advantage and what cognitive mechanisms are actually associated with that advantage. Uh, what, what is driving any advantage that we see? Uh, <clears throat> so just to uh, outline the, the project, it was started in 2016 and it's very recently completed. Our, our work was um, funded by the Leaf Hume Trust with some side projects uh, funded by the British Academy. And our main focus, which is very much underpinned by the evidence base in the literature, is on auditory and visual attention and high level cognitive control. So response inhibition, problem solving and so on. So our question is whether bilingual acquisition really does underpin advantages uh, in, uh, in these functions. So our approach, um, employs a range of different methods. So we use behavioral methods, also neuroimaging methods, primarily structural MRI uh, and eye tracking studies with infant populations. Uh, we also acquire lots of other um, data, linguistic experience, data on socioeconomic status and so on. So these are alternative explanatory variables for the bilingual advantage. Uh, the idea being that um, studies haven't routinely or adequately controlled for some of these um, some of these variables and if you do control for them uh, research indicates that the bilingual advantage essentially disappears. Um, the measures we use include measures of executive function as I say we also looked at uh, metacognition, verbal fluency, uh, working memory and so on. Um, really to try to narrow down the key mechanisms that might be sensitive to the whole process of acquiring another language. Uh, we tested over 600 participants, which included infants, adults, uh, children, adults and older adults. Um, because there's also, of course, a literature on uh, whether um, being bilingual or being multilingual confers a kind of a, uh, an advantage, maybe offsets um, the, um, the emergence of, a, of primary progressive brain disease, for example, which is, a, which is um, 
a pretty hot topic at the moment. Uh, and also just whether um, it's bilinguals in general have better cognitive function throughout the lifespan or at what point does being bilingual confer the best uh, benefit, potential benefit. So it's fair to say that our research, the results um, that we found to date, we've got um, a whole range of publications uh, and we've reported positive effects and we've reported negative effects of bilingualism and also no effects at all. Uh, so we have something of a mixed bag here, uh, but we can draw general um, inferences across these studies and I'll be describing some of them today. Uh, the clearest pattern we've seen is that the, the bilingual advantages that we have identified in our smaller scale studies, so these are studies with generally um, relatively low sample sizes, tend to disappear in our larger scale studies. So where we have larger scale studies where, you know, as long to the extent that we're comparing like with like, uh, we'll have more reliable results. Um, we tend to see either a diminished bilingual advantage or no bilingual advantage at all. But we are also detecting um, kind of some kinds of advantages, not so much in general executive function as in uh, some kind of perhaps lower level cognitive mechanism that does seem to be sensitive to whether a person is bilingual or not. Uh, but overall, I think the trend uh, causes difficulties for those who um, robustly defend a bilingual advantage because the advantage tends to be there in the smaller studies, but not in the larger studies. And this is consistent with quite a lot of uh, recent meta-analyses in the literature as well. One of the first studies we applied in this research was a speech in speech paradigm where um, we, uh, where participants had to listen to simultaneously presented sentences. <clears throat> so these were canonical sentences, a relatively low comprehension demand, such as the cow is pushing the frog, and non-canonical uh, sentences. These are the relatively high demand sentences, such as the frog is pushed by the cow. And this task is based on um, Elizabeth Bates' work uh, with Marwini um, dating back from the 1980s. Uh, we essentially used their par paradigm and modulated it. In the first study, um, this was undertaken with Italian participants. Um, so Italian bilinguals and Italian monolinguals. And this is the essential setup that there'd be a target sentence that uh, the participant would listen to. And then there would be interference and that could be verbal interference where um, somebody of the other gender would be presenting a sentence at the same time <clears throat> and the participant needs to obviously attend to the target sentence and we can then measure accuracy where they have to identify the agent in the sentence. Um, so I've got a couple of examples. Um, you may not hear this, I hope you hear it, but we'll have a go anyway. There is an audio file here. So in this example, the target is the English sentence, which is in a female voice, and the interference um, is in English with a male voice. It's Goat the cat, the wolves the are biting. Now the theory here is that the bilingual can do this task better than the monolingual because of all this exercising, this cognitive exercising, having to communicate in the two languages and select between them. I have another example. This time it's an English target sentence, but the interference is Greek here. So this is an unfamiliar language to our participants. It's the frog that the goat is grabbing. Right. So now I'm going to go on to um, describe the key findings from these smaller scale studies using this paradigm. <clears throat> First of all, in adults, we compare 20 Italian English late bilinguals and 20 English monolinguals. Uh, so, as I've already said, the task is to, it really measures the comprehension of Italian senses with English or Italian interference. Um, 
And we found that the bilingual adults were more resilient to the verbal interference than monolinguals, but that was only really observed for the non-canonical sentences, so the more difficult sentences. They were able to attend and respond um, so semantically process and therefore uh, respond appropriately uh, in the more demanding condition. And levels of the second language proficiency were also a significant predictor of better interference control. <clears throat> so you can see that in this graph here. In the left set of bars, we've got the canonical sentences, they're less interesting. On the right, we've got the more difficult non-canonical sentences, where you can see the effects for bilinguals in blue, um, Italian monolingual um, in red. And you can see that the Italian monolinguals are really struggling, particularly with uh, the interference being in the same native language. And we're not seeing that in the bilingual. So there does seem to be a significant benefit at play. And in this chart, you can see that um, essentially as a function of um, bilingual vo uh, vocabulary ability, um, we see the more proficient bilingual adults are better at controlling interference than the less proficient ones. So again, that's consistent with this kind of benefit that's driven and underpinned by multilingual acquisition. Uh, and then we ran the same study with children, essentially the same study with children. So we had 20 bilingual children from different backgrounds and 20 English monolingual children. So these weren't Italians this time. And the comprehension was of English sentences with English or Greek interference, Greek interference again being the unfamiliar language. And we found that the bilingual children were again more resilient to interference when comprehending the non-canonical sentences. So largely consistent with the adult study, <clears throat> but it was really the unknown language um, that was more successfully filtered at an early age. And we saw filtering of the known language, English, um, which presumably provides even more demand in terms of passing the two and, and um, selecting between the two audio, um, audio streams, that improved later on in development. And we can see that uh, in this chart, um, essentially no differences across a lot of the conditions, but if you look at the final set of bars, you've got Greek interference, um, and uh, we can see that the bilingual children were significantly more accurate on the task. Okay, and these are the non-canonical sentences, again, the more difficult sentences. Uh, so it seems that the ability in controlling interference um, does improve with bilinguals, but there's very little evidence, if any, for an improvement in the monolingual children across the age range studied. Right, so now I'm going to switch from these smaller sample studies to the large scale study that we were able to conduct through the um, funding from the Leverhulme. And we tested 209 school children, a slightly different age range, seven to 12. Um, and you can see the breakdown for the monolinguals and multilinguals there. And to cut a long story short, we found no significant statistical differences between the monolingual and the multilingual children in all experimental conditions. So we have a disparity here between uh, the studies. Um, now, in this slide, you can see just how similar the trends are for the monolingual and the multilingual children. There are a few conditions I haven't um, described to you, which are also included in the tests, and these were where the interference was either congruent or incongruent with the semantic details of the sentence itself. And we also looked at control of unrelated interference too. Um, and uh, we just weren't able to detect any differences between the groups. So we thought this was pretty interesting and quite frustrating at the time in a way because we were kind of expecting the, the, um, the results to, co to kind of back up or support what we found earlier, but we didn't. Um, so we thought we would try to look at these data in perhaps a different, more um, novel way. We use multivariate statistical techniques, cluster analysis, and what this approach does is it groups individuals according to their performance characteristics. Uh, if, those are if, if anyone's interested in finding out more about this analysis, they could look at our cognition paper, which is, has just been published. 
Uh, so cluster analysis then potentially at least provides more in-depth understanding of children's performance. It doesn't provide effect sizes, F statistics and so on, but it does allow you to get a feel for the clustering across the bilinguals and monolinguals as a function of performance. And what we found, in fact, was that the distribution was essentially the same whether or not um, a child was monolingual or multilingual. So again, it suggests that there really wasn't anything systematically different in terms of performance on our task between monolinguals uh, and multilinguals. And you don't really need to understand the details of these um, cluster diagrams, but essentially what they tell us is there's not that basically there are these clusters are non-overlapping. Cluster one shows the best performance and the representation within cluster one has an equal number of multilinguals uh, and monolinguals. And similarly, the third cluster, which is the poorest performance, again, has similar um, numbers of multilingual and monolingual children. And we can also look at... Okay. We can also look at these data with respect to uh, kind of background demographics and so on. And we really don't see anything um, popping out that might tell us, um, might lead us to, to, to some kind of difference of interest between the monolinguals and the multilinguals. Uh, we've also looked at neuroimaging research, and this is a little bit, um, it's actually quite intriguing, we think. Uh, we found evidence, for example, that those with better control of verbal interference also show high grey matter density in the right paravermis. This dates back to a 2011 paper. That's in uh, panel A at the top of the screen there. If you go straight to panel C, uh, this is a new study where we directly compared uh, monolinguals and bilinguals and, um, as a, um, at, and looked at the interaction between group and condition. So this is high interference versus a control condition on the sentence interpretation task. We again find a sensitivity um, in the bilinguals that just simply isn't there in the monolinguals. And the bilinguals also have significantly greater gray matter volume in the paravermis of the cerebellum. Despite these, uh, you know, this evidence of functional or structural plasticity, which might be underpinned by bilingualism, there was equivalent performance on the test. So there were no behavioral differences in performance. Uh, we've also looked at uh, socioeconomic status. As I've said earlier, this is one of the variables that's been highlighted as a possible confounding covariate in a lot of the data explored to date or um, the data published to date. Um, because it's actually quite difficult to match bilinguals and monolinguals on socioeconomic status. And when you do, there is some evidence that the bilingual advantage essentially disappears. Uh, we tested 90 participants aged between the age of 18 and 30. 40 were from demonstrably low socioeconomic status backgrounds, typically uh, refugee asylum status, a lot of these participants had. Um, and they attended a government funded vocational course uh, in London. We looked at performance on a battery of tasks, including the commonly used Simon task, which looks at uh, congruent and incongruent, kind of visual versus motor stimulus response mappings, and also the Tower of London test, which is a well known test of planning, looking ahead, and strategy formation. So we have lots of uh, data um, and we were really asking the question, is executive function, um, does, is, is it, does it, are scores higher in bilinguals than monolinguals? In terms of background measures, um, the groups were equivalent. And we found again, something quite intriguing we think only for the low socioeconomic status bilinguals, we found a response speed advantage. Um, for the high socioeconomic status participants, there was no difference between, um, in, in terms of bilinguals and monolinguals. So again, what this seems to be suggesting perhaps is that bilingualism may offset some of the disadvantages that emerge or result from reduced accesses, access to resources associated with low socioeconomic status. Uh, in those with relatively high SES, then being bilingual did not provide additional value. However, 
Um, in terms of the Tower of London test, which is a test of planning, unfortunately in the low SES bilinguals, we actually found a disadvantage. Um, and in terms of response times as well on the Tower of London test, the bilinguals were taking longer uh, on some of the key uh, components of the task and the key measures of the task. So overall, these results seem to suggest that socioeconomic status may be an important modulator in the interaction between multilanguage multi acquisition and cognitive development. But it doesn't contribute to better cognitive performance in high SES individuals and may offset some of the low, so, you know, the effects of the low socioeconomic conditions. So general conclusions, questions are still open. Um, now, even though we, sh you know, our data overall provide very little evidence for a general uh, advantage in central executive function in bilinguals, um, we're not suggesting for a moment that um, there should be any discouragement to raise children as multilinguals. It opens up all sorts of opportunities and so on. The question we're trying to answer is whether it directly um, induces cognitive advantages. And we argue that we really do need this kind of developmentally informed framework in order to better understand how bilingualism alters neurocognitive networks and whether it underpins genuine enhancement of domain general cognitive abilities. So just for a stop, um, it's quite a big team that is working on this project. Special thought goes out to Annette Karmeloff-Smith who passed away uh, so recently. And if any of you uh, want to learn more, there's a list of some of our recent publications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for that very clear presentation. Uh, there are a few questions I'd like to ask first. You mentioned that it's difficult measuring SES, um, and especially when you're talking about uh, refugee families. I was wondering, does that often come with lots of confounding factors around a drop in income and employment grade, and could background SES in the home country be contributing more than the bilingualism to the comparative advantage for that group? Uh, quite possibly, yes. It's, 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 it is very difficult to um, control well for socioeconomic status um, simply because on average, for example, if we test bilinguals in the UK or here in the London or Cambridge area, on balance, the bilinguals will have higher socioeconomic status typically than the monolinguals. Um, and so a lot of effort needs to go into taking account of systematic differences uh, and spending a lot of time in the recruitment strategy to ensure that you are either controlling um, through sampling or otherwise very carefully controlling uh, statistically once you have your sample. Thank you. um, there's a question from Christos Piatsikas. Um, asking for some details on the linguistic background of the multilingual children in the large sample study. Uh, for example, where they were tested, what opportunity they had to actively use their languages, and were these details comparable to the small sample study, which did show advantages? Well, there's a broader range um, of uh, proficiency um, in, the, in the large sample, not surprisingly. Uh, the children were tested in quiet rooms at school, mainly. Uh, so there are a number of different schools that we um, collected data from, primarily in Cambridge, but also in London as well. Um, we, 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 we administered a pretty comprehensive language history questionnaire, and we have a pretty good idea on, on um, the categorization of the participants with respect to simultaneous versus early versus late uh, stages of, uh, you know, when they actually learned the, the, the language to begin with. So we're pretty sure, we're pretty confident that um, we, you know, that the participant, the way we've um, tested the participants and categorized them is accurate. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question from Nga Yan Hui saying, uh, what were the language pairs of the multilingual children in your study? And do you think that the language pair matters? Um, 
sorry, can you ask that again? I've got a, a, one of my children is shouting at me from outside, sorry. Um, so the question was what, what languages were spoken by the multilingual children in the study and does that matter? Uh, it might matter. We don't know. We're not able to really determine that or not. They were from a range of languages. So we didn't specifically set out to um, restrict the number of languages spoken. The uh, number of second languages spoken or first. English was always a language that they spoke. But um, the, other, the, the other language just was highly variable. And, but it's listed in tables throughout our publication. So if anyone wants to know about the, um, the variety there of languages spoken, they can find it there. Um, there are quite a lot of questions. I'm going to try and choose some that are on different topics. So um, Tom's Voigt has asked, uh, you mentioned in the beginning that you recruited participants across the lifespan, including later years of life. Uh, he'd be interested to hear more about results from ageing populations if that data has been yeah. analysed. I did wonder about presenting that. It has been analysed and it's been published as well. Uh, that paper is it's either Frontiers or QGEP. Um, we have systematically compared older bilinguals and older monolinguals who are carefully matched. Uh, and we the tests we applied were... The, I think it was the Tower of London, the Simon Task, and perhaps one or two others to really get to grips with, um, you know, measuring executive function, response inhibition, and so on. Um, we found no differences. We found no differences. So there was, the, our data didn't um, kind of back up recent reports of um, kind of, you know, being bilingual offsetting uh, cognitive deterioration in older age. Um, Anne Navu would like to ask if you have an opinion about how some of the executive function tasks we've been using for a while, such as the Simon task, do not seem to necessarily measure the construct we expect them to. Well, that's been demonstrated quantitatively a number of times. Um, you could, I can't think of the, the, the author names at the moment, but people, a number of researchers have, for example, correlated different tests which are thought to measure in, inhibition. And these tests tend to be quite poorly correlated. So all these tests are, are presented as tests of inhibition, yet they don't seem to correlate particularly well together, which suggests that um, we need to perhaps do away with the whole term cognitive inhibition and actually try to narrow down the contributory mechanisms to performance on these kinds of tasks, because clearly there must be different things going on in these different tasks. I think we've got time for one more quick question. So Maria Torero Garcia would like to know um, if you're using bilingual and multilingual interchangeably in this research, is there a distinction between bilinguals and multilinguals? Did you analyse results by speakers of three plus languages? We did categorise, we do have all that information. Um, we haven't systematically looked at that yet. Although uh, I think, although we haven't published it, I think uh, my colleague Roberto may have done some some basic analyses on these data and they are, I hope I've got this right, they are suggestive that um, a third language or a fourth language does not add very much to, um, you know, the pattern of results you get uh, in a two language bilingual participant. 